Welcome, everyone. My name is Aisha Jackson, and we are the Culturally Sustaining Teacher Educator Professional Development Collective. Before we get started today, I'm going to give just a little bit of logistical information for those of you who are joining us. We have a Q&A option for you to post questions if you at any time during our presentation today have questions for us. If you would like to unmute yourself and ask questions to participate, you're welcome to do so. We just ask that you raise your hand and then with the assistance of Young Buck, you'll be unmuted. Because this is being recorded, we want you to know that if you do choose to raise your hand and speak, that your video won't be shown. Only the icon that you have in Zoom will be recorded for the purposes of our webinar today. So we invite participation from the audience. There will actually be several times throughout our presentation that we do ask you to, to join us and speak along with us as we delve into this work that we're calling STEEPED, Culturally Sustaining Teacher Educator Professional Development. Before we talk about how we've come together, I'm gonna to set the context a little bit about why we are steeped and why we call ourselves a collective. This quote coming from Bell Hooks as she cites Peck really grounds how we think about ourselves. We are coming from three different institutions around the country, the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, the University of Hawaii at Manoa and Nevada State College in order to do what one of my mentor calls the archeology span of self, and that's quoting Yolanda C. The Ruiz. It's that deep work of excavating the wounds and the dispositions and the experiences that have negatively impacted who we are and how we engage in others. And so as a group of people committed to being in community with others who are doing similar work, we seek to first transform ourselves as we think about an inquiry process that will allow us to hopefully meaningfully transform teacher education. Um, my name is Tara Plachowski and I'm just gonna talk a little bit about um, our context here in how we have come together as the group that we currently are. Um, I've had the great fortune to work across these different contexts and um, realized in my work across the different contexts how unique an opportunity um, is presented if everyone that I've worked on with, who is so brilliant and so dedicated and committed to the community could come together to learn from one another. And even the structure and, um, and the different voices that are in each of our contexts really could be leveraged for a much deeper learning if we pointed that awareness and realization towards our own development as teacher educators. And so the, the, we are the ones here in this space now, our collective is larger than this and spans the context of Nevada State College, UNLV, UH Manoa, and embracing equity. Um, and we're very excited about what that potential actually, you know, means for us in these contexts. Um, I'm going to pass it off now to Lisa Ben Dixon. Hello, everyone. My name is Lisa Ben Dixon, and I am faculty in the educational psychology department as part of the College of Ed. And I'm very excited to be here. I work a little more indirectly with teacher ed folks um, a lot of the time, but I am very excited to have a, a good discussion today about our collective questions that you have um, and, and welcome. Thank you. I'll pass it to Lois. Good afternoon. I am so thrilled to be here with all of you in the audience and certainly my colleagues. It has been really enlightening uh, having these conversations. I am the coordinator of clinical field experiences for the Department of Teaching and Learning at UNLV in Las Vegas. Uh, we are located in the fifth largest school district in the country, uh, Clark County School District, and my responsibilities include placing all of the pre-service teacher candidates in the field in more than 50 different schools throughout the school district 
Uh, I work with all the elementary and secondary undergraduate candidates and also the alternative route to licensure graduate students in our programs. Roughly 450 students every semester. So I feel a great responsibility in working with all of these students in their teacher prep. And I will turn it to Wynell. Yes. Aloha mai kako. Um, my name is Wainel Yu and I teach and learn at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. I coordinate one of our statewide master's programs that leads to licensure. Um, our program, our statewide programs allow people living on the neighbor islands and those who might be teaching full time um, be able to participate in our programs because we offer a lot of our uh, coursework in a hybrid on learning, uh, online learning format. Um, I'm very much uh, committed to ensuring that a sense of purpose and a sense of place weaves through um, every aspect of our program. Um, I will pass it on to Jamie. My name is Jamie Kent. I also work at University of Hawaii at Manoa in the MEDT program. My role is an instructor and cohort coordinator, so I support aspiring teachers as they pursue their licensure in our master's program. I additionally work, we work really strongly with a professional development school model. So I work very closely with our schools to influence the training that our candidates need. Um, and additionally wear hats, things like the assessment coordinator and the person who enthusiastically loves alumni um, as well. All of things that are ways I get to influence our work. Thank you. I will pass it to Rashi is underneath me in the boxes. <laughs> uh, thanks, Jamie. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm calling today from Austin, Texas, uh, which is the occupied indigenous land of the Tonkawa, the Apache, and the Coman Comanche. And I am the chief strategy officer of Embracing Equity, um, which is an organization that works with teachers and teacher educators to cultivate anti-racist mindset skills and practices. Um, and I will pass it to uh, Dr. Aisha Jackson. I am Aisha Jackson. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am an assistant professor of teacher education at UNLV. And I largely work with our alternative route to licensure candidates. I have had the privilege of being the inaugural interim program coordinator for our new alternative route to licensure program pathway, where we are partnering with Paradise Elementary, a local elementary school that actually shares space on the campus of UNLV. And I've also had the pleasure of working alongside a small number of Black and Latinx in-service teachers who graduated from our program, thinking deeply alongside them, how we can change our practice to be an MSI in the true sense of what it means to serve our underrepresented students. Tara. Thank you, Aisha. I'm calling in from the land of the Kanaka Maoli on the big island of Hawaii. And I am a, um, a teacher educator who's worked across three different state contexts, um, both in university-based teacher courses, as well as in field-based supervision for teacher candidates. And I'm going to pass it along to, I'm gonna pass it back to Rashi for her to speak to you about your why for being here. Thanks, Tara. Um, as Tara said, you know, um, we really want to get to know you. So thank you for introducing yourself, telling us a little bit about your names, pronouns, roles and organizations. But we really want you to also just take a minute and share into the chat box your why. Um, your why for you know being part of this webinar, your why for uh, what, why you, culturally sustaining pedagogy or education um, matters to you. Um, so if you could just go ahead and just take a minute to do that, we will wait for you to do so. Yes, what brought you here? If there's somebody that also just wants to come off mute and uh, voice over their why, um, that would also be great. You can just raise your hand and we can help you get unmuted. Ah, Megan, thank you for uh, putting in your why. Um, you want to learn more? You have a background in ESL. Yes, exciting. Um, English is also my second language. So that uh, resonates very deeply with me. 
um, and excited for, for you to be here. Hi there. Hi, Lydia. I'm interested in diversity because I believe in diversity because I'm part of diversity. Oh, yes. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for having me. Oh, Kristen, thank you for sharing. Um, yes, culturally sustaining practice is culturally responsible. We have to continue to learn. Um, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Well, you know, you, you can feel free to, um, oh, uh, I'm going to butcher your name. I think maybe it's Devin or Devon. I'm not sure how I'm, pronounced, I'm pronouncing it correctly. You should feel free to uh, phonetically put it in the chat so I can make sure I learn it. Um, but thank you for sharing. You're excited to add more cultural competency lessons and presentations to the early outreach curriculum um, and want to learn how teachers are approaching this in the classroom daily. Yes, thank you so much for sharing. It's, um, I think that's a sentiment shared by lots of teachers wanting to know how to do this in their classrooms in very actionable, tangible ways. Great. Well, thank you all for sharing your whys. Um, and we're going to actually do the same. Uh, so thank you for modeling the vulnerability for us. We're going to now share with you a little bit about why we are doing this work as well and why we are um, in this collective. And with that, I'm going to pass it to Lois. So this basically came about in a very informal conversation. I think Tara and I were having about the state of our teacher preparation now due to the challenges of the last year and a half. And I would say some of the opportunities that we want to, to embrace uh, in preparing our teacher candidates in spite of and because of COVID and the pandemic. And we were talking about the relationships you know, that, that we always say are so integral to education, relationships that teachers have with their students, the relationships that professors have with their own students, the relationships I have with, with the folks who are working as university supervisors in the field, the relationships I have with my students. And we were also wondering how that was affected by people not being together in person, and then more so how there was possibly a disconnect in how people look at those relationships and understanding of, of the people that they're working with and how to prepare our candidates to be responsive to all of the children in the schools that they're working with, with their colleagues. And we started to wonder if this was ever discussed really, you know, people are just put together to work together. Candidates are placed in schools working with different populations of, of children and working in different communities. And we were wondering what is their preparation for this, especially if these are communities and, and populations that are very different from their own backgrounds. So we wanted to make sure that there was a way to have those conversations and to find out how we could better serve our teacher candidates and prepare them better for life and, and for being able to teach and to look at the possible disconnect that occurs between the university and the students in the university that are now going into the field to become teachers the possible disconnect between the mentor teachers and the children they're teaching and the teacher candidates, and even the possible disconnect between the university supervisors and the teacher candidates. So if they're all coming from different places and different perspectives, how do they develop that relationship and understand what they're supposed to be doing and, and how they can be the best practitioner to serve the community and the students. So that's basically how it all started. And what I wanted to do was make sure that I am doing everything I can to prepare our future teachers for all circumstances, whether they're in the classroom, whether they're teaching virtually, whatever grade or content area they're teaching and to make sure that they are understanding the students and the communities where they work. 
Okay, aloha again. Um, I think as I share my why, I'm going to circle back to this idea of sense of purpose and sense of place. Um, you know, I see a lot of UH Manoa connections in our audience here. So you know what a big part of what we do at the College of Education is tied to that um, idea. Um, the College of Education at UH Manoa is the largest preparer of teachers in the state. Um, and because of that, I feel it as our kuleana uh, to ensure that we're not only using culturally sustaining practices um, as we prepare um, our very diverse group of teacher candidates, but we're also producing teachers who are very committed to creating these equitable experiences inside their own classrooms. Um, and as a new faculty member um, for the program that I'm working for, um, I realized that I've been feeling a lot of tension um, between the ways that we encourage our students to um, enact culturally sustaining practices in their own classroom and the ways that um, uh, higher ed and teacher education in general um, embodies and materializes white supremacy culture. Um, and so as our university seeks to become this place of Native Hawaiian learning, I found myself constantly wondering, what does that mean for teacher preparation? Um, and so those are the kinds of things that I'm hoping to reflect on and um, learn um, as we're engaging um, in this collective. Um, and I'm hoping that my participation um, will help to give me confidence um, in knowing that we're doing this work together um, in changing some of our practices so that you know, culturally sustaining and anti-racist practices become more norms in teacher education rather than the exception. And I could echo a lot that has already been said by my colleagues. So. I'll start with saying my why actually starts with me being a black student educated in predominantly white schools, but then I'll advance to my doctoral experience and some of the research that I've done. The research says that teachers of color make a difference for students of color, and I believe that, but I think we make a lot of assumptions that teachers of color are going to be good for students of color, and that's just not the case. And so when I was a doctoral student researching the experiences of teachers of color, they were saying that their teacher preparation did not give them the tools and the skills that they needed to have a sociopolitical consciousness, that critical consciousness to engage in anti-racist pedagogies. And my why for being part of this group is to be part of creating systems of educating teachers that speak to that, particularly for pre-service teachers of color and, and early career in-service teachers of color. What's our responsibility in higher ed with all of these initiatives to diversify the workforce for education to make sure that we're preparing teachers in the best way possible to positively influence underrepresented communities? And so I do believe that we have to start with ourselves in our own practice so part of this work in the collective is examining our own pedagogy to create ways where we can facilitate culturally sustaining approaches, beginning with the culture of this group, and then figuring out how we translate that into practice in our institutions. Uh, thank you. My why has to do um, kind of, it obviously relates to my personal journey, which is um, I would say in the last five years, a serious criticality movement in my own journey. Um, as with other teaching, teaching and doing research in, in higher education can be isolating. So I wanted to grow as a scholar and a human being by learning from those who are also interested in equity in teacher education, such as this collective. Um, Raising awareness around equity is vital, but I'm also coming to understand that it's not enough. Equity takes action. Um, and I'm really looking forward to being a part of that in this group. So I see that criticality as it relates to action. I, I'm hoping as this ripple effect that will take place in our own, in our own work, but then as we work with other colleagues. Thank you. Um, as I said before, I've had um, the great privilege of working across multiple different contexts, including um, all of the institutions and groups that are represented here right now in our collective. And I think what I'd like to say first, as I'm, I'm listening to my friends and colleagues speak, is that my reason for why and maybe more how I got here is attributed to each and every one of them, and that um, they have been able to create um, loving and sustaining relationships, but also relationships that make it possible 
um, for me to hold myself accountable to different things and for me to be pushed and for me to grow. And so what I, my why for being here is to create a sustained space that can exist across the context and doesn't just get to sort of happen organically, but a very intentional space where we can continue to do that. So we can have loving and trusting relationships, but also hold one another accountable to the very hard work that it is to make equity action in the work that we do in higher ed and to call other folks into that action alongside us. Um, and so that's that's my why for doing the work. And um, in the end, it also has to do with, like others said, being able to turn our aha moments and our energy and our power back towards recreating spaces in higher ed that are more equitable, more affirming, that, that really show us walking the talk that we do. Hi, everyone. Um, my why has to do with, you know, the young 12 year old Rashi that came to the US, um, who is who did have English as a second language. And as I think back to my formative years, the reason where the reason I am where I am today, I attribute it largely to my teachers. Um, and I, what what I think what instilled in me, um, uh, having kind of moved to the US as a child, is the uh, the power of education as a lever for social change. It can be harnessed for a lot of good. It can also be harnessed and have a lot of trauma that it causes um, children. And and I I my I see um, my purpose and and kind of why to be part of this collective is to create a world where all children show up to schools and learning spaces where they feel fully affirmed. Um, where they feel fully included and where they can truly um, achieve and grow to their fullest potential. And right now that isn't the case for all kids. Um, and right now stark kind of race-based outcomes mark the US system. And uh, until and unless we start thinking about teaching and learning uh, as an inherently anti-racist activity that requires practitioners to truly be anti-racist um, in all aspects of themselves and in their teaching and in their classroom and in their interactions with parents and communities and, um, and everything else that goes around with teaching and learning, we're not going to get to a place where um, all kids are able to be in these environments that truly nurture them. And so that is, that is my why. Um, I, that's my why. Yeah. Thank you. Hello all. Um, it's an amazing crew, right? So um, as a queer person, I think enacting community for me is a necessary life um, outcome. And I think throughout my life, I've had incredible opportunities and I'm here at all because people have advocated either for me or alongside me or in community. I've had the opportunity to teach um, young students, to organize alongside teenagers, to change policies that allowed me rights that I didn't was not did not have when I was born. Um, and so I believe change is possible when people act together. Um, why this? I am humbled to call myself a faculty member at the University of Hawaii. I am a settler and a visitor to this space. And my ability to even be in this department is because several people invited me to do this work. Um, and I know that if I operated alone, that my training as a white person, right, would lead me to colonist tendencies. Um, and they do on a regular basis. And so operating with others in a space where I can learn um, to listen first before acting sometimes um, has been the, given me the opportunities to really feel like what we're doing here in my time in my department in teacher education um, is worth it. So um, I'm very humbled to call folks like Waynell up here. I think um, my ability to be here at all is because she has invited me into this space and provided me opportunities to work and think alongside her. And it's been fun. And now meeting these folks, I feel even more prepared to continue to 
um, actualize something that I believe is possible. So thank you all for being here. So um, our collective that you've just met pieces of consist of teacher educators across these three institutions. And our work takes place right now within a virtual learning setting that's hosted by Embracing Equity. Our first goal, and we'll share a few of our kind of current aimed outcomes, but our first goal is to build this collective, to build these, this relationship among these teacher educators across these institutions so that we can further develop our critical consciousness and our anti-racist identities. And uh, our second goal in this um, initiative is to really look at um, engaging our collective in, in PD and um, then putting that into practice. Um, I think academia positions us as faculty to really be seen as experts, you know, in pursuing various research projects. Um, but something that I realized in my own work is that culturally sustaining pedagogy isn't a but about like reading articles and conducting research. Um, it really requires us to be reflexive in examining our own identities, our culture and our experiences um, first, right? Um, and one of the ways that we want to do that um, examination is through a professional development that we will um, engage in together as a collective. Um, and this PD will then lay the foundation for um, pedagogical action projects, which will give us an opportunity then to go back and revise our curriculum to look at our instructional strategies um, and use this collective um, as a peer network uh, to challenge and guide our efforts. Another goal is to leverage our collective to transform teacher education programs. Uh, being responsible for our teacher prep programs and, and placing so many field every semester, I, I thought, you know, are pre-service teachers exposed to all of the knowledge that they need to work with the students that they are working with because they are from so many various backgrounds and speak a number of different languages and have very different heritages and practices in, in culture. So how are university supervisors and, and mentor teachers contributing to culturally sustaining pedagogy? And are faculty even addressing this? You know, or do they think that this all happens in the field or magically? And, and what if the mentor teachers are not exhibiting culturally sustaining pedagogy? And then how are we going to make sure that pre-service teachers are learning to be culturally responsive? All of this is going to impact how we prepare our pre-service teachers. And finally, we have the goal of engaging in a critical, critical participatory action research process. And the criticality comes from the kinds of questions that we will first ask of ourselves and engage in throughout this, this learning experience that we have in the professional development, as well as thinking across our contexts and within our contexts. And so, again, we are first building the community that will allow our learning to happen. And we want to figure out how we can sustain that own, our own culture and then transfer that to the work that we're doing with pre-service teachers. And as researchers, we'll be documenting this process, writing about it and taking advantage of the unique opportunity that we have to look across three very different institutions alongside the work of embracing equity in order to write findings that we hope will impact the field. I'm going to speak for just a moment some of the details of the plans that we have made so far, but that we are also, um, I should say, co-creating this journey together, right? And we that means that we have to be open to the chaos and, um, and embracing that sort of ability for change and shifting. So that's why we've named it a tentative roadmap. So our first process is one that we're engaged in now, which is building community and relationships among our collective members. We're then going to dive into a series of five sessions across a ten, a, about 10 weeks that are focused on our own de identity development for anti-racist and anti-biased practice. Towards the end of those sessions, we begin developing our own action projects 
And one of the benefits of this collective is we all have such very different roles in schools and colleges of education across the collective that our work shows up differently in different spaces. And so these projects will truly be hugely diverse and how they get mapped out. And so we'd like to spend an additional um, eight to 10 weeks after that focused on co-developing, creating and enacting those projects using each other as a critical friends group for those action projects and what they look like in higher ed. As we do the first series of sessions and as we move into our sessions on critical action projects, we're gonna continue to collect data of various types on the work that we're doing and map out what's happening with that so that hopefully we have a process at the end of the two sessions where we can reflect, look at the data that we've had, organize and try to make sense of our findings, right? And before we start to move forward, really pause and reflect and ask ourselves based on those findings, based on that data, what will effective systemic change really look like? Where do we go from here, right? We've all been um, parts of projects that sort of spring up and have so much potential, um, but there's not enough built-in time for reflection and planning. And we believe that um, we wanna be really cautious as we move forward as a collective and use critical reflection really authentically throughout the entire process in each step. And I wanna say just a little bit about how we came to bring in Embracing Equity as our partner, right? So there is a tendency in higher ed that we have discussed for the work of teaching and learning to be decentered. And we have found even with the best of intentions across many higher ed contexts, other things get put before teaching and learning, both implicitly and explicitly in how the system works, that teaching tends to be decentered. And all of us um, spoke to a need to recenter the work of teachers and teaching. I mean, it's very typical that you frequently hear of how much PD and professional development that K-12 educators have to go through. And yet when we talk about PD in higher ed, it looks and feels like a very different kind of thing. And again, often it decenters our work as educators, right? And our goal is to try to recenter that and rethink about ourselves really authentically as learners. And having embracing equity as an external facilitator helps us do that, helps us get out of our own heads, get out of our own context, and let us just lean into somebody else's perspective on the work that's being done. We also want to reaffirm a commitment to walk alongside P12 educators in our communities, right? And really re-embrace the fact that we are learners alongside them. And often it seems that context really create an imbalance between those relationships and those collaborations where we are seen as the experts coming in and doing something and P12 is supposed to follow suit right, and follow up and, and provide us the data that we need to keep telling them what to do. We really wanna sort of disrupt that typical power structure and start to walk alongside folks. That's another thing that Embracing Equity does and Rush is gonna talk about that in just a moment. And we believe that that framework that Embracing Equity uses is really ideal for us in so many different ways across a lot of our roles in rethinking about what it means to have a liberatory, affirming, and equitable space. Rashi, I'm going to pass it to you to talk a little bit more in detail about embracing equity in their process. Thank you, Tara. So um, embracing equity is an intentionally virtual racial justice organization that supports both K-12 teachers as well as, teach as, well as teacher educators to cultivate the mindsets and practices needed to create affirming and inclusive learning environments. And, you know, when we think of anti-racist practice, oftentimes if you think about diversity, equity, inclusion, or anti-racism, it's like a tack on to your plate, right? It's like, in addition to pedagogy, in addition to curriculum and instruction, how do I now incorporate equity or anti-racism? But really, you cannot have effective teaching and learning without an anti-racist practice. 
And this is, this is kind of where embracing equity comes in. And so specifically, uh, embracing equity is working with this collective to connect the inner change with the outer change for collective change. Um, you'll see on the next slide, for example, that in order to truly disrupt systemic racism, we need to tackle it at, at three levels, right? We need to tackle it through individual learning, raising our own racial literacy and critical consciousness, through interpersonal actions, building community and being in community, and then through institutional transformation, really transforming systems and organizations and um, at large. And so as teacher educators, it's not just about kind of tweaking at the edges of pedagogy or, or pedagogy development or thinking about what instructional moves we, we need to make. It's about all three of these things, right? It's about developing our own critical consciousness and leveraging our collective power to truly transform teacher education programs at large and at scale. And um, embracing equities work, um, we know is working because we have data. Um, our graduates uh, tell us that you know, when they engaged with embracing equity, that was an inflection point in their lives. And as a result of, of this work, they're able to kind of recognize racism when they encounter it and are much better equipped to do something to take anti-racist action. And so we know that the embracing equity program works, right? And now we want to just take a few minutes to tell you a little bit about how we are going to build upon this work um, on what we know works to really guide the work of our collective. Um, and with that, I'm gonna pass it to Aisha. So we're gonna let you kind of behind the veil, so to speak, of some of our approach to this work. In these next four slides, we have some of the essential questions that we've been engaging as a group to start this process of not only developing our own community, but also to think about how we begin to craft projects that might allow us to affect change. And so these are questions that we invite you to think alongside us with. Share in the chat, raise your hand, drop things in the Q&A as we consider first and foremost what our comfort level or confidence level is with the following. Engaging in conversations with others whether they're peers or colleagues, about your own identity and lived experience in relation to marginalization and privilege. This is where we're starting in part because again, that individual level of learning is essential to the framework that Rashi just mentioned, and it informs how we interpersonally interact. So it's a self-check. It's, it's that archeology span of self that I talked about earlier that becomes foundational to our work. And so I'll, I'll leave space for anyone who would like to share to be able to share around these questions. How about someone from our group? I'm happy to share a little bit and, and I can say that I know and that I recognize now, um, even though I've been intentionally engaging in these conversations for over 20 years, that just recently I've become more mindful about my own triggers, how I re react to them, and when I stay silent and when I choose not to engage. And I notice that when there's a power dynamic in the room, when I have a lot to lose, I notice and I look historically and I see that there's been a lot of interest convergence in when I choose to engage in these conversations and when I choose not to engage in them. And so for me, I think this question is, is really continuing to be, despite feeling like I've been doing work around equity and pushing towards an anti-racist identity for years, that I still have a lot of room to grow in this area. I'm gonna go ahead and move forward to some of our other questions as well, but feel free to jump around. Um, I'm inviting my colleagues to do that, but also you as participants here to engage with us to either answer the questions in the chat or speak to the questions, whatever resonates with you. Raise your hand and we will certainly unmute and you can come off and join the conversation as well as we go through these. 
And again, this next question, even though it is part of our inquiry and self-reflexivity, it's getting us to a point where we begin to think about what institutional change looks like. So how do we identify first and foremost, and then seek to disrupt some of those existing structures that are rooted in bias, whether it's implicit, explicit, uh, microaggressions, nativism, racism, et cetera, what's the work of identifying them and then disrupting them? And then again, what's our individual level of responsibility in confronting some of these things? We don't profess to have answers to these questions, but these are the kinds of questions that we are constantly engaging in, not only in our individual work, but as a community. And as we talked about wanting to see change and what it would look like, part of that change has to do with developing a sociopolitical consciousness and culturally relevant pedagogy and sustaining pedagogies, not only for pre-service teachers, but with our peers and colleagues. Again, systemic change will require the buy-in for more than just the kinds of people who show up at these webinars. And so part of the work that we hope to do is to bring in other people to expand the collective so that other people, other colleagues who might not be ready for this work now would be encouraged to engage in this work in the future. I see a hand up. Um, I think you guys bring up a really wonderful um, question. Um, I think uh, it's the essence of being honest with yourself and honest with the community. I think that's a, a really difficult task nowadays, but I think we're getting closer to that because of the technology, being able to be more honest with your text and things of that nature. But um, I, I think it is truly important to, to know where you stand and who you are and um, and be able to to say what you believe in, but at the same time, um, maybe because I'm older now, I'm able to, to be more assertive as to who I am and what I want to say. But I think with, t with kids nowadays, it's something that we have to install and, and help them achieve that. And it's not easy. Yes, thank you so much for sharing. And I think that's one of the, the reasons why we're so excited to work with Embracing Equity and that intentional virtual community, because it does allow us to connect in ways that we probably wouldn't as a group with some of us being in Hawaii, some of us being in Las Vegas, Rashi being in Texas. Virtually, we can all come together in ways that would probably be impossible, if not very costly, for us to do without the use of technology. Yeah, and before we move on to the next question, the one thing I just wanted to share is, you know, at the end of the day, I feel like with, with, with anti-racism work in general, or in general in PD, I think the, the instinctive kind of uh, go-to move is to try to, you know, like, redo your curriculum or to figure out, like, what to do differently you know, um, like, how do you redo your classroom or what have you, when I think a lot of this work has to start at the individual level, right? You have to ex excavate a little of your own socialization and understand how you came to be who you are before you can start really unearthing, you know, what things to do differently in your pedagogy or your curriculum and an instruction. And, and I think like what this collective is doing, which is unique, is that it's creating that time and space to do that deep dive into self instead of just saying, okay, how do I fix the systems around me, which feels very depersonal and feels easier to do and frankly, in some ways, but at the end of the day, no matter your best laid scope and sequence or curriculum, it's the human being that's going to have to <laughs> deploy it and implement it and practice it. And until, and unless you work on that human being, which is yourself, none of this other stuff matters. Right. And so I think like, and, and the comforting thing, I think, with that is to know that with practice, you can get better even at the self-excavation um, and that it's a learnable skill. It's not just you were not just born this way and you're destined to live this way for your whole life. And so that's been really optimistic and uplifting. I'm going to move us along to talk a little bit about um, critical participatory action research at this time, but we're definitely going to come back to those inquiry questions if you would like to continue reflecting on them at the end. We've left a little space for that. And really, our inquiry project, our research is still in the developing phase, but I can speak to a little bit about the conversations we've had about why we have landed in the area of critical participatory action research. And it's these four things explicitly. 
a real desire to eventually have that goal of impacting the larger field of teacher education. The systemic change is part of where we see research as an integral part of. Um, to mindfully collect and leverage multiple perspectives. Um, I know in my experiences, and I feel confident that my colleagues will agree with me, when I'm doing research in a group where we have the trust to push and pull against each other and our own assumptions, the research always is better. It is always deeper. It is always more centered in really explicit um, outcomes that have benefits to community, right? We want to resist and disrupt white logic and hierarchical relationships, not just in the work we do as a collective and in our PD and in our development, but also in any research that we take on and any process that we take on. And we want to embrace dissonance and dissent in making sense of what happens when we come together. And then again, how that filters out into our context and gets leveraged for change, how it impacts the communities that we work in and among. And I wanna invite any of my colleagues to speak to any of those issues and the things that I have, may have left off. And I also invite you all as participants to speak to any of this and the research that you're doing or the work that you're engaging in. And that invitation helps transition us to the next slide. So we'd like to know really what your thoughts are, any reactions, reflections, comments, or questions that you may have at this time. Because again, th this work is all about the engagement and the participation and sharing, learning together. Oh, I just wanted to say that um, I have enjoyed this and I'm excited to get more involved with this as I become part of the College of Education. Um, I'm excited that this is going on and that I kind of found it randomly before um, we start with y'all because um, I think it's such important work. So um, I look forward to becoming more involved with this and learning more and, and joining on the pathway. And thank you for sharing all of your um, great insight today. Well, thank you for your comment and find us when you get here. Lydia? Oh, hi. I just wanted to say thank you for actually coming together. I think it's an interesting topic and I would like to be involved more in it. Um, I think that it's very important and crucial to make connections, especially with our students, because um, they're going to need those skills to connect with others and develop employment and so on and so forth. So I think this is a great start. And um, if, if possible, I'd like to be more involved. That's great. We would love you to be more involved. Thank you so much. We'll find you. Thank you. Thank you. I see uh, Christine was talking about uh, specific ways in which she felt comfortable and uncomfortable and speaking up or sharing. Do you, do you feel comfortable <laughs> speaking of that, um, elaborating on that a little bit? Maybe I can comment um, on what uh, Christine had shared with us um, privately, because I, I feel like what you've uh, put in the chat resonates with me a lot as well. Um, I think especially being in, in Hawaii and being an Asian settler, um, in many ways, um, you know, Asians, particularly Japanese Americans, um, have done a really good job of positioning themselves into positions of power and actually acting in ways that are oppressive to other um, people of color. And I think that's something that um, I have become a lot more self-conscious and aware of, um, you know, in, in recent years. And um, definitely something that I continue to reflect on uh, um, in, in the work um, that we do in the collective and something that I hope to examine more carefully as well. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, and echoing um, as another fellow Asian, South Asian specifically, I feel like the thing that I've, uh, what has helped me is that coming more and more to terms with the fact that we have, we have both internalized oppression and internalized superiority and, and that that's okay and that you just have to be able to figure that out and, and we're not perfect human beings, we're never going to be, um, but that that can't necessarily be the barrier to doing this work and voicing our voices. And we're gonna have pitfalls, we're gonna make mistakes, 
Um, and just kind of understanding that that's part of the process and not thinking of mistakes as like taking them personally or thinking them as something personal. Um, and that we don't have to be perfect people to be have to have a voice or to insert ourselves, so to speak, into into these conversations and into this work. I wanted to, um, as we come close to our hour here, just say how deeply grateful we are for everyone who showed up and gave time today. And um, the time that we spent collaborating on what we thought was important to present in this space was so deeply useful to us. So you showing up and being here, we're very grateful to that. And um, the ways that each of you engaged is also so important to us. And I know that everyone on this call, whether they engaged or not, is involved in work in their own context and their own communities. And um, I just wanna express gratitude for the work of teaching and learning that you all do in your various different spaces. And specifically, I wanna express gratitude to young Bak Kim. And I want to express gratitude to Nancy Weaver who helped set up this presentation and make our sharing with you possible. Um, and I will share our contact information here. And we can also drop this into the chat for anyone who'd like to reach out to us and continue to engage, right? And I wanna also invite my colleagues if they choose to, to come off mute and say any final words. I'll just say thank you very much. And um, because this is a collective, if you are interested in joining us at some level, please do let us know because that that's exciting to have you join us in some way or another. So keep us posted. And I'll just add a thank you to the College of Education at UNLV for putting this webinar series together and extending the invitation to us to participate because I do feel like every time we get together, we learn so much. And then for all of you who joined us in the audience as participants, I learned from you. So thank you.